This segment is going to provide an overview of shock and then review the stages of shock. So what is shock? Shock is circulatory compromise or failure of the circulatory system to perfuse the vital organs. So what do I mean by perfusion? Perfusion is blood flow and blood is what carries the oxygen, glucose, protein, electrolytes and hormones to the system. Without oxygenation, remember the cells switch over to that alternate metabolism without oxygen and the byproduct is lactic acid. So now we have a situation where the system is in an environment that's acidic and we have a metabolic acidosis and the cells don't function very well, an environment where the pH is not 7.35 to 7.45. So let's talk about the initial phase. The system is starting to have a lowered blood pressure, starting to have circulatory compromise. The patient may feel kind of a vague complaint, non-specific complaints, maybe short of breath, and maybe just not feeling well. Then as it progresses to the compensatory phase, or it's actually the non-progressive phase, I'm using the word progressive, in the compensatory phase, the two systems that help regulate blood pressure kick in. So it's the autonomic nervous system and the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. How does the autonomic nervous system do that? Well, we're responding to this lower pressure in the carotids and the aortic arch, send a signal to the hypothalamus, which then sends a signal to the adrenal medulla and bam, those catecholamines are released, epi and norepinephrine. Also, a signal is sent down to the adrenal cortex where cortisol is released, another stress hormone. So now with epi and norepi circulating, we're gonna have an increase in heart rate, that's gonna be compensatory, and also the effect on the vasculature to try to improve blood pressure. And it's gonna result in a more elevated blood sugar because of cortisol release. How does the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system do that? Well, those juxtaglomerular cells will respond to those lower pressures and renin is released, that hormone. Renin is then converted to angiotensin 1, which is then converted to angiotensin 2. Bam! Angiotensin 2 is such a potent vasoconstrictor in the system. Not only that, angiotensin 2 causes the release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. So that's the second hormone that is released in addition to cortisol. So what's the role of aldosterone in blood pressure is that it helps restore intravascular volume. So not only is tone restored with angiotensin II, but also volume as that sodium with water following it now re-enters the intravascular space. So blood pressure is starting to fight to improve. How will the patient present? Well, certainly their blood pressure is going to show a drop now, even though these two systems are in play trying to keep it up. Respiratory rate's going to increase because of chemoreceptors that send a signal to the adrenal medulla in the brainstem to increase the rate and depth of ventilation, the body trying to compensate for what it knows to be a decreased oxygenation and blood flow. In addition, the kidney, which requires a tremendous cardiac output, is going to know it's not getting its blood flow and it's going to decrease its urine output. Remember, the, the kidney, the renal system, is the most sensitive indicator of internal organ perfusion. So when you have that diminished urine output, you know that the rest of the system has a compromised blood flow. Also, the system will, or the patient will, appear cool and clammy, and those are also effects of epi and norepinephrine shunting blood to the central circulation, so therefore they're gonna be cooler in the extremities, and also a sympathetic nervous system response is to have diaphoresis, and so they'll, they'll appear clammy. Then the progressive phase sets in. So in the progressive phase, you're going to have significant drops in blood pressure, and this is when you have multi-system organ failure kicking in because of that compromised perfusion. So every organ system is affected, and certainly when one system fails, then it's not easy for other systems to kind of have their back and to compensate. So you could develop adult respiratory distress syndrome with the respiratory system. Myocardial depressant factor is released from the heart. Your cardiac system begins to fail. We just mentioned that 
you know, when the renal system is not getting blood flow, that's when you get what's called acute tubular necrosis or basically acute kidney injury. The liver, the GI system, they're all going to be compromised in their blood flow. So then as we go to this last phase, the refractory phase, that, that's when there's no intervention that's going to, to save them and that death is, is imminent in that phase. So, okay, now we're going to just do an overview of the various types of shock. Hypovolemic, so even the name tells you what's wrong, is that the patient has a diminished blood volume. So whatever the underlying reason for that is, whether it be a hemorrhage or just good old dehydration, there's a specific type of hypovolemic shock called burn shock. What you do about it is you just replace the volume, whether it be pectoral blood cells or isotonic crystalloids. Next type of shock, cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock, we can just think of as pump failure. Your heart's an ineffective pump. Can't perfuse, can't produce a sufficient cardiac output. So what do we do about that? Well, the most efficient thing to do or the best thing to do is to, an intraortic balloon pump. Patient may not be a candidate or for whatever reason that's not going to happen. Treating them medically, positive inotropes or things that improve contractility, preload reducers, things like what? Diuretics, Lasix, nitroglycerin or venous vasodilators will also reduce preload. The thing is about this non-obstructive type of cardiogenic shock is that it's just an extreme form of congestive heart failure. So if you think of it like that, you can say, okay, how do we treat the heart failure patient? And that's what we do. We give also afterload reducers, those pril medications we were talking about when we discussed afterload in the hemodynamic clip. So an afterload reducer will just make it easier for this ineffective pump to produce good cardiac output. Maybe fluids, because you want to make sure you have in, uh, sufficient intravascular volume, but you have to be really careful because you could make that pulmonary edema even worse. So cardiogenic shock is easy to understand, but probably the most difficult to treat and manage. We discussed the non-obstructive type cardiogenic shock just now, but there's also the obstructive forms of cardiogenic shock. Tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade is when the pump is being squeezed. So that's also easy to understand and actually relatively easy to treat if you're able to uh, relieve that pressure around the heart. Okay, let's go on to a septic type shock. So sepsis is um, very, has a very high morbidity and mortality rate. So with sepsis, the system has been attacked by gram-negative or gram-positive organisms. And how does that occur? Well, there's different sources, and the challenge really is to figure out what is the source. So if they have a central line, remove the central line. Is it because of an indwelling Foley catheter? Take out the Foley catheter. And sometimes you can't remove it. Maybe it's from the lungs, from an underlying pneumonia. So whatever the source is, that's what you have to do is address it. Sometimes that means just make sure antibiotics are getting into the patient. So what happens with a sepsis or a septic shock is that these organisms cause this inflammatory process to occur. They also call it systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And those inflammatory mediators that we mentioned a little bit in the immune segment cause a vasodilation to occur. So this is the first shock that we're going to talk about that's the distributive type shock. And with the distributive type shock, you have vasodilation occurring. And with vasodilation, you have what's called a relative hypovolemia. And all that means is that you have insufficient blood volume, but it's not because it's not there, it's because there's vasodilation of the vascular space. So in addition to making sure your antibiotics are on board, trying to identify the causative organism, making sure you support the patient's airway, mechanical ventilation, definitely fluids. Anytime you have any of these distributive type shocks, fluids is always going to be appropriate because you want to fill up that vascular tank, try to get it to where it could hopefully meet the vital organs. Vasopressor therapy also very important in sepsis because there are very potent inflammatory mediators and your vascular space is really fighting to stay open and you just have to fight right back and apply vasopressor support. 
anaphylactic type shock. We did discuss this when we talked about the immune system because anaphylactic type shock is just an extreme allergy to something. So whatever the patient is allergic to. And what happens is after they're meted with this allergen, your IgE or immunoglobulin E attaches to it and causes a release of the um, histamine from those mast cells and the basal cells. In addition to histamine, other substances are going to cause this immune response to occur. And that immune response is going to cause airway closure. So in this type of shock, you have to worry about airway closure in addition to cardiovascular compromise. So with that being the priority, and then your vascular space having this relative hypovolemia, open the airway with epi or if you need to intubate, because remember epi has the effect on the bronchioles causing bronchodilation, and well, remove that offending, um, offending antigen first and foremost. So epi fluids to fill up the vascular space, antihistamines, because remember we're fighting a histamine response here, steroids being those mast cell stabilizers, one of the functions of the steroids, so that will suppress the immune response. Vasopressor therapy to hopefully close up that vascular space. Okay, neurogenic is the last type of the distributive type shocks. In a neurogenic shock, we have either a suppression of the sympathetic nervous system or an exaggerated parasympathetic response. So what does that mean? Well, we know that the sympathetic side is the fight or flight side. It's gonna increase everything, increase blood pressure and heart rate. And if you suppress that, what you're gonna have is just that, an unopposed vagal tone or un unopposed parasympathetic response, and you're gonna have a vascular space that's wide open. So it's the same idea, fill up that tank, fill up the vascular space. Another thing that occurs with the neurogenic type that doesn't occur with the other type shocks, because really in those type of shocks, we, we talked about how the heart rate's gonna increase as a compensatory response. In this response, because your sympathetic nervous system is suppressed, we might have a bradycardia kick in, which is gonna make cardiovascular compromise even worse. So in addition to fluids and vasopressors, you may have to add atropine.